So I came to Oregon about two and a half years ago to um, join the Oregonians data team. And I came from Arizona where I didn't have all that much trouble getting data or getting metadata. And I found a very different experience in Oregon. So that's part of why I'm very interested in that, uh, in this topic. And to follow on the keynote um, speaker, I think there's, a, there's an opportunity in Oregon right now and maybe also in other states to, to talk about public records and change public records law, um, and I'm, I'm quite interested in that. So um, I'm going to focus mostly on the state and local level, but I think the same principles that I'd like to talk about also apply at the federal level in some way. Um, and toward the end, I'd like to have a discussion, uh, if you're all game, about how to um, make sure that kind of basic information about data sets that government already keeps are made uh, publicly available to the extent possible. So that's my... Uh, that's my general interest. So I wanted to start kind of from the beginning, maybe even before making a public records request, you have to figure out what exists. And um, I come out of a reporting background, not a, not a data or technical background, and so I, I sort of didn't know how to start thinking about that. Um, and I started just mostly with academic papers, and then I would just kind of like spit back out the name of a data set to, uh, to a public records custodian and sort of like see what happened. But there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of places to get ideas. Um, I really like requests for proposals. I cover a lot of law enforcement um, issues through data sets in Oregon. And um, I started, uh, when I started here, by making a request to the Portland Police Bureau for a data inventory um, and kind of what record layouts they had available. And it ended up with the sit down with the city attorney who read my request back to me and debated the meaning of each word, and this took like 20 minutes. So, um, so that might happen to you. <laughs> That's the bad news. <laughs> so maybe you want to have these thoughts um, up front. Uh, so, so inventories of databases, sometimes they exist, sometimes they don't exist, uh, as in the case of Portland Police Bureau. Um, but it's a good place to start. Uh, a lot of state agencies in Oregon anyway have those. Um, it's more difficult at the local level. Um, agency directives, um, all of these are links and you, you're welcome to explore them later, but I, I just kind of gave you some recent examples of uh, places where I had found data sets and on the subject of directives, I was reading through the, the Portland Police Bureau directives related to gang designations, and it actually like, tells you about the data in, in the directives. And so I went back and asked them for it. That led to an odyssey. Um, but I, I had a good starting point, and they did eventually get some data. Um, reports and audits. Um, quite obviously, again, talking about the local level, here in Portland there's a a great auditor's office, and so they'll put out an audit and then they'll make available everything underlying it. And you can learn tons of stuff that you may not know exists otherwise. Um, performance measures at the state level, they, um, each agency does those at the bottom of each little graph. It says the data source, and I've learned about tons of, uh, tons of databases there. The Federal Register, again at the federal level, is another great source. And of course, ask people. But um, I just kind of wanted to zoom all the way out because I think we um, sometimes narrow our scope of what we're, what we're really talking about. I'm interested in systems. I'm interested in how programs are working. And agencies often have some, some record of that, um, some record of what they do. Um, and I think that's a productive way to think about it. So going back to Portland Police Bureau, I asked for the inventories, asked for the record layouts. And I learned that uh, some of them are protected by trade secrets. Um, however, in another case, this case was more optimistic, I asked for the record layouts and I got this beautiful um, spreadsheet which told me what all the fields were, what the data types were, um, how many characters were available in each field. And this is really uh, useful in Oregon as you're negotiating. Um, because quite often there's a very high price tag at the beginning. I've gotten cost estimates of a million dollars, cost estimates of, in this case, I think $27,000. Um, and part of the reasoning uh, when, when we got down to it was they said, well, you could put a social security number anywhere 
And so we have to have an attorney review every single field. Um, so one of the arguments that we made was, you know, you can't even have enough characters in this field um, to, to contain the social security number. It seems kind of, kind of obvious or, or maybe a little bit um, idiotic, but you really do end up having a lot of those conversations. So I think it makes a lot of sense to start with what metadata you can uh, get in order to be in a good negotiating position when you get a cost estimate. So highly recommend that. Um, so writing a data request. Uh, I think in whatever state you want to reference the law, maybe, maybe specifically use the language of the law um, in your kind of introduction. I'm asking for the following records. Use the name of the data set that you found in your beautiful audit or report or that you've gotten from an academic um, because the more specific you are, the more authoritative you sound and the more seriously they take you. Um, when I don't know what fields exist because the, I haven't gotten access to that metadata, I, I will quite often like kind of make a wish list of fields and sometimes that's productive in that you'll find, well, that isn't in this database, but that's in this other database that we can link to. And so, like, just really lay it out. Lay out what you want and sort of see what happens as part of a conversation. I think you should treat it like a sort of opening statement. Um, sometimes I also mention fields that I'm not interested in. If I know there's a credit card number or a social security number, even though they're not supposed to keep those, um, I'll say, don't give me that. And it sort of, I think, I think they also appreciate that you're um, cognizant that there may be things that you're going to be negotiating over. Um, of course, I think probably everybody here wants a CSV file, so ask for it specifically, um, one or more. Um, and I also sometimes specify, like, I don't want a PDF and I don't consider that to be um, like a satisfying answer to this request, so don't give me that and I'll, I'll put that in the request letter. Um, if I haven't gotten the documentation, I will still ask for it in the formal request for the data. Sometimes, this happened to a colleague of mine um, recently, she was negotiating with a state agency, she asked for the record layout, she asked for data dictionaries. They went through a, through a variety of terms. <laughs> she got a variety of denials. And then in some conversation, um, somebody mentioned the extensible properties. and. Uh, Lo and behold, there was like a beautiful data dictionary that was exactly what she needed for this very complex data set that they had said, it'll be totally obvious like what's in the data from the, the headers, like there's no way you won't know. And of course she gets the data and it makes no sense. Um, but the extensible properties were there. So sometimes I'll just like lay out all those terms and then also have a sentence of descriptor. Like I want to know what tables exist, what fields exist. I, I take that approach because I think you want to use technical language to show that you have technical knowledge, but you also want to make sure that the person who reads your request who might not have that technical knowledge like understands to the extent possible what you're going for. Um, and you can sort of avoid these conversations that make no sense or they don't give you something because they don't understand it. Um, and then I kind of also put a lot of emphasis on like, please don't hesitate to contact me. Like, did you get my request? Did you understand my request? Like, who's gonna be handling my request? Um, I think that's especially important for data um, as opposed to other kinds of records. Oftentimes, especially at, lo at the local level, there's only really one person who handles the data and they don't always have a tremendously high um, level of expertise and it's not the only thing they're doing. So befriend that person. Um, and always be extremely polite. I think it really matters. Uh, so then you get this variety of denials. I've kind of already previewed them. But um, one thing here very often is I'm not obligated to create a record for you. They say, you know, we, we just provide records that exist. And this is especially problematic in data uh, when you have an agency that doesn't have very much expertise. We were talking earlier, one, one um, strategy that I've used in the past is, you know, I, I think I could, I could just write the SQL query for you and that, that'll save you some time. And I haven't actually gotten the opportunity to do that, although I've gotten close, but it does, um, it does kind of crack the nut open sometimes. So try it, I don't know. Um, 
they, they realize that you can do it and that it's quite embarrassing if they can't. Um, I kind of referenced this earlier with social security numbers. If there's, if there's information that is personally identifiable and that you sort of like agree to negotiate away, um, that earns you a lot of good faith in part of the negotiation. So I will quite often like start there. If you have somebody who's just denied you, denied you, denied you, but if you start to talk about what you might give up, um, things can open up. So I think kind of try that early, um, at least to open up the conversation and not, not necessarily negotiate anything away, but indicate that you are willing to do that and you want to see the full array of information that's included so that you understand that what you get will not cause you to make an inaccurate conclusion in the end. Like, these are my research questions. I, not everybody has this approach, but I, I do try to be pretty transparent about what I think are important questions that are in the public interest, and I'll, I'll bring that into the conversation. Um, too much work? Again, I'll help you. Um, like, I'll sit by your computer. I'll, like, I'll write your queries. Um, then back to the trade secret, copyright. We'll talk about that more later because um, we have a potential solution that we propose. And most important, I think, of all is like don't let it go at no. A lot of these conversations go in many, many circles. It's kind of like cascade of circles. And you'll hear no, and it doesn't mean no. So don't let it mean no. Um, appeal. In Oregon, uh, there is a an appeal process that doesn't require the courts, at least in the first round, if you're um, getting, getting data from, uh, say, the city of Portland, then your venue for appealing is the DA's office. If you're asking for data from a state agency, then your appeal venue is the attorney general's office. And it's really worth checking that out. I mean, you make an argument quite often related to the public interest, and, and they consider it. Um, I've had a lot of success that way. So you'll hear no in various forms, and some of them, especially at first, will be informal. But you want to make sure that they cite the law specifically in their denial. You want it in writing, and you want to know which statute it is that they're referencing. If they're talking about what they can and can't do and what the regulations are, remind them that's not how the law works. I mean, th those aren't appropriate citations. There really need to be a statutory uh, reference that they provide. Um, I, for example, with the police bureau, I think, you know, go to their boss. There's a political system over, over the top. People don't like to hear that you can't get what you want, especially if uh, it does relate to a question of the public interest. Try it, it doesn't always work, but I think it's worth it. Um, so I guess I have already mostly covered this. So um, I really tried to fill this presentation with a lot of resources you could go back to later. Um, this book up top I found tremendously helpful and one thing, especially for the newer requesters out there, it has a lot of example letters and a lot of negotiating tactics. I think the letters especially are helpful. You can see how different people do it. Um, so check that out. Here in Oregon, there's also a state public records and public meetings manual. I think there's something similar a lot of places. Enormous amount of resources there. And um, the appeal decisions that have been made in many jurisdictions are quite often online, or you can request those as well, and that's give you guidance. Um, lastly, I wanted to especially highlight the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. And um, they have state-by-state -state guides, so not all of you are from Oregon and don't want to hear about the city of Portland endlessly, but, um, but they do have state-by-state -state guides, and it's sort of a, a, in an outline format that is the same from state to state, and part of the, the breakouts is electronic records and how, you know, what the case law or statutory law is related to that. It's, it can be quite different from state to state. So, on the subject of change, um, I uh, had asked for these record layouts that I, I didn't get, and they were cited as trade secrets. I appealed all the way up to the CEO of the company, which was based in Canada, <laughs> which, uh, one of the lines from Portland Police is, well, we, we chose a, a Canadian company because they take privacy more seriously, and so we can't actually join these tables through a unique identifier, um, and that was by design. Like, you can't join these tables. Uh, 
So I thought, that was, I thought that was kind of funny, and I didn't think that the CEO would tell me the same thing, but he did. Um, so the Society of Professional Journalists, the Oregon chapter, put together a language for a bill that, that has, is now being considered in the House Rules Committee. And the idea is that it would require when any f agency in the future goes out to contract for database software, the software would have to export in an open format and that the record layouts or related documentation would be public record without trade secrets or other exemptions. Um, it was going pretty well until this week um, when, when there was a hearing and what we heard was the, the local governments thought it would massively increase the cost of contracts and um, there is a particular software uh, vendor, a big software vendor, that wouldn't like to see this going forward. Um, and they proposed a lot of language. So part of what I'd like to open to the room is, you know, what is the right way to frame that? If my intention, maybe our shared intention, is to make information about what data government collects available so that requesters can seek that information if they have a question that they'd like to answer with it. Um, how do we best make that available? I mean, this is one idea. There's, there are others moving forward, but I'd really, I think that's a conversation we all ought to be having is at least to know what exists. Uh, that really ought to be something that's more widely available. So I'd love to hear from you. That's all I've got. Um,